hate the indifferent. I believe that living means taking sides. Those who really live cannot help being a citizen and a partisan. Indifference and apathy are parasitism, perversion, not life. That is why I hate the indifferent. Cultural hegemony. Now this is an important concept that in many ways is the backbone of a lot of contemporary cultural theory and behavioral science. The word has been around for a long time. It derives from the Greek verb meaning to lead, but it's usually associated with ideas about domination and control, as in the means by which one group dominates and controls another. So let's start by thinking of it as a special type of agreement. It's an agreement in which the person agreeing doesn't necessarily understand what it is that they've agreed to. The author most commonly associated with the contemporary use of the term is a Marxist thinker named Antonio Gramsci, although he was building on the work of a lot of people who came before him like Nietzsche, Machiavelli, and of course Marx. Gramsci's developed his theories of cultural hegemony in what are now called the prison notebooks, a long series of essays he wrote while imprisoned by the Italian fascist regime from 1926 to 1935. Now, I don't want to put words in Gramsci's mouth, but I like to think that these notebooks started with him looking out the window of his prison cell and being like, What? Seriously? Fascism? What the hell's going on here? Why would anybody in like a zillion years ever be like, Oh yeah, fascism, let's do this. What could possibly go wrong? Anyways, Gramsci died shortly after his release due to his deteriorating health from his living conditions while in prison. But his, the theories that he developed while in prison lived on. Now, like the Shawshank Redemption of intellectual theory, his ideas slowly drilled their way into the consciousness of cultural theory. His notebooks were smuggled out of prison and were eventually published in the 1950s and then translated into English in the 1970s and have since taken behavioral science by storm. Now, his theories are d dense and complex, and it's obvious that he was in stressful conditions while he was writing them, but once you get a rough of idea of what he was mapping out, it's not too hard to see what he was trying to say. Let's start by looking at some easy examples of how power and cultural work was something that you may have already heard before. It's called The Riddle of Steel, and it's from the 1982 movie Conan the Barbarian. The Riddle of Steel. Yes. You know what it is, don't you, boy? Shall I tell you? It's the least I can do. Steel isn't strong, boy. Flesh is stronger. Look around you. There, on the rocks. That beautiful girl. Come to me, my son. strength boy that is power so putting it in terms that Gramsci would agree with the riddle of steel is the recognition that weapons are nothing compared to the belief of the people that are wielding the weapons or to put it differently controlling a person's loyalty is the key to power for Gramsci power comes from consent and according to him it originates in subtle otherwise innocuous types of agreement 
Gramsci further challenges us by suggesting this process is even more complicated than it may first seem by suggesting that people don't control ideas, but rather ideas control people. Or, to put it differently, people don't wield power. Power wields people. Here's an example of this in action. Over in the U.S., we're edging up on the 2016 elections. Elections are a great time to watch hegemony in action. So, take a typical Joe. At some point, Joe will be presented with a political ideology. This ideology will include pleasant-sounding ideas and beliefs, often very vaguely defined, that Joe may agree with. Once Joe decides that he agrees with that ideology or political party, then he'll make all of his political decisions from that point on, not from his own judgment, but from the answers that his political ideology has decided for him. That, my friends, is hegemony. But don't judge Joe too harshly. We do this sort of thing all the time. For example, I'm going to bet that a lot of you put a pine tree, or maybe even a plastic pine tree, in your house this Christmas and decorated it with plastic ornaments. Why? Why a pine tree? Why not some other type of tree? Or, another example, men often give women a diamond ring when they propose to them. Why? Why not some other type of pretty rock? Or, why... Do we grow grass in our front yards instead of, I don't know, food? Now, the point Gramsci wants to make isn't that we should weigh the merit of these particular traditions in and of themselves necessarily, but rather that we need to pay attention to how these ideas got put in our head in the first place. You didn't think of the idea of putting trees indoors, or rocks on rings, or growing inedible crops. These ideas were given to you, and they are the ideas that literally control your actions at least in the sense that you exhibit specific behaviors and actions simply because these ideas are in your head. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are political, economic, religious, and ethnic ideas, all of which you accept passively, that govern your actions and behaviors every day. It's actually kind of frightening when you realize how many things you do every day without having any idea why you're doing them. And this collective influence of all these different ideas on your actions is what Gramsci meant by cultural hegemony. So, 